So good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm Mason Pike, I'm the Indianapolis West State, as President Kelly mentioned earlier. As he also mentioned earlier, several of us, the presenters this morning, had the opportunity to attend Film Out in New Mexico this last July. It was without a doubt it was an absolutely wonderful experience. We were taught by the Spirit, the great instruction was given. And I know with the fact, for a fact that as you have an open mind and an open heart, the Lord will teach you and I the things that we need to know and do to go back and strengthen our young men and our scouting units. And speaking of strengthening, that's what we'll be discussing over the next few minutes. The operative word being we, not I, but we will be discussing, and that is strengthening shepherds. And I want to start off by doing two things. One, I want to ask a series of questions. I don't want you to answer it right away. Instead, I want you to write them down in your journal or your notepads. And I want you to start thinking of what those questions mean to you. The first question being, what does it mean to be a shepherd? Second, what does it mean to be a shepherd to a young man? As you start to think and reflect on the things that those questions mean to you, let the Spirit teach you. And to help you do that, I'm going to show you a video that the church has produced about a young man, a young man, relatively speaking, probably perhaps the rest of us, but a young man by the name of Bill Mallet. And his experiences with shepherds. And as you listen, look for those characteristics of a shepherd. And as you think, ponder those two questions. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about these questions, and then to share with your colleagues, with your neighbors. Because once again, we're learning, we're teaching from one another. And after which, we're going to have the mics go around, and we're going to have some of you share your comments. But we'll go ahead and show this next video. I'm Bill Mallet, and I'm from North Carolina. And I really know the state of cares about each and every one of us. I always went after the last year. Some people went after me. Don't have a simple little thing. Change my life and made me who I am. I really see the Lord's hand in my life to these people, and I'm extremely grateful for it. I grew up with my mom and my sister. At first, I, I didn't want to go to Scout. I was baptized, but my mom told me, <coughs> You're going to go to Scout. <laughs> and so I went on one camp out, and I fell in love with Scout. It was the best, the most amazing camp out. I had so much fun, so much fun. And, and just really loved it. But then, for whatever reason, I became a sacrament. And I always had people reaching out to me, to keep me just linked to the church in some way. I had a really wonderful scoutmaster, William Flotman, who would drive across the city, pick me up, and, and bring me to scouts. I remember he said to me one time, and just talking to his truck going to a scout activity, he said to me that if I could do five things, I could name my first son after me. And he listed out the five things he said. You need to get your Eagle Scout. You need to graduate from seminary. You need to serve an honorable full-time mission. You need to graduate with a useful degree so that you can get a job and provide for your family. And you need to get sealed to the temple. I doubt that he knew at the time that it would have such an impact on me now. Um, that I would look at those five things and that I would really want to do them because I admire them so much. My mom, she had uh, lots of health problems. It made my own life difficult. Um, it's really rocky. And, and my, my mom, she had trouble taking care of herself, and she was taking care of me. Um, when I was 16, I was reaching out for, for a more stable home environment. Uh, Dave and Becky became my foster parents. Um, Dave had been my scout master, and Becky was my seminary teacher. So I did both of them extremely well. Um, it's been an amazing blessing for the past five years. Because I, I grew up without a father figure in my home. Uh, I never had someone just reaching out one-on-one -on -one and talking with me. Um, they, they've always been that. They did it daily. They would, we would always have dinner together. We would always have family home meeting every week. And that's a big thing, just to see how a father takes leave of family and does it consistently. They was there to, to help me out with my Eagle Scout project. And he also helped me a lot with duty to God. As I look at these men and women that, you know, really inspired my life, there was just something you just feel about. 
practice what they preach. They had a, let me show you how to do it, actually. You know, to show you that it's possible. You can do this too. It's here. Come with me and do it with me. Show me how to do it. These people really brought up the best thing. I was able to get my scalp, graduate from seminary. When I graduated from high school, I was about Victorian. I got the top Eagle Scout scholarship to the Boy Scouts of America, which is now paying for my college if you want to do, which is really incredible. <laughs> uh, I was privileged to serve in Brazil, Sao Paulo, South Mission. I hope that David Mackey saw uh, that what they had done for me uh, was able to be spread with each one of us can receive revelation. The Lord will help us know what to do. I'm so grateful for those leaders that listen to the Holy Ghost and were inspired to pray to receive revelation. They would help me. Because that made all of the difference in our life. So this is a, a great post-video story with regards to Bill Mallet. He, if you recall, he had that, that, that challenge from the scoutmaster. He were to do those five things, he could name his first child after him. And so we learned at Philmont that so far he's met four out of the five. That he's just waiting to find that, that significant other. But he's graduated from BYU and is currently, I believe, at medical school in Michigan. So a phenomenal story, not only about a fabulous young man, but about strong shepherds. So as I mentioned earlier, I want to go ahead and have each of you take a minute and write down the thoughts and impressions that, that come to mind, not only as you watch the video, but as, as it relates to those two questions. And as you wrap up, you're writing down your notes, go ahead and please share your thoughts and impressions with your neighbors. So in groups of two or three, go ahead and share your thoughts and impressions. And after that, once we kind of have started to die down, we'll go ahead and have our, our, our helpers go around. And I'd like to hear from at least four or five of you and share with us and teach us what it means to be a shepherd and what it means to be a shepherd to our young men. So go ahead. Share with us, the rest of us, your thoughts and impressions as it relates to shepherds. What does it mean to shepherd? What does it mean to shepherd our young men? Uh, I relate it directly to what uh, we've been trying to emphasize in the North State, and that's uh, to be a minister. And if you read the handbook, too, it's uh, to know their names, to love them without judging them. To visit or interact with them one by one and to visit them in their homes. If you do those four things with each of your young men, you'll have a lot of success. That's fantastic, especially loving them. Who else? In the center? We just talked about how a good shepherd helps the sheep reach their potential. Um, and the only real way, you know, we felt of being able to do that was through the spirit. I mean, every boy is different, so. So modifying your approach as it relates to each young man seeking the guidance of the spirit to do so. <coughs> One thought was clear is we're really just under shepherds, representing the Lord in our capacity with young men, so just being sensitive to keeping that perspective in mind. I love that. Under Shepherd. Love that. Certainly love and uh, being a guy, being an example came up in our discussion. And, and specifically to, to young men, uh, we talked a little bit about giving them the opportunity to also be shepherds or mentors to those uh, 
members goes. Absolutely. How often do we fall into the trappings of, well, they're too young. What, what do they know? What do they have to teach? A lot. A lot. Who else? I think the shepherd provided the vision. Not only did he challenge me, he said, you can do this. And then he made five things. So it's very important for them to know what they can do and express your confidence that they can do it. Absolutely. There's a brother in the back. So one thing that's come to my mind is, is um, I think I've always thought of shepherds being an independent person who works with a group of boys, right? But I think our works with a group of a flock, right? I think one thing that's coming to my mind as I'm sitting here is thinking about how as youth leaders, how we can work together to better understand the youth, the different observations we have in Sunday school or activities trying to learn about what do we perceive and be able to work back with our leadership to say, here's what I saw, here's where I see a need. I'm thinking about how can we ensure we're in our flock as a group and we can better function. That's great. That, and I want to make a point real quick. So where I, I work for the NCAA, one of the things that I am responsible for in my particular division is, is overseeing our mentorship program. And that is spot on where one of the things that we learned very early on was having our mentors come together and talk about best practices, what's working, what's not working, learning from one another. You know, not only is there learning from the mentor and mentee or from the shepherd and their flock, but we can definitely learn from one another. I'm sorry, over here. I really liked uh, the example they shared here with uh, Brother Valetti, and it really made me think, who is that lost sheep that I'm missing? And you know, what are his needs, and how can I transform his life so he's leading to a, to a, toward a trajectory where he knows who he is and where he wants to be and how to get there? Absolutely. Yes? <laughs> One of the things that I always thought of uh, in leadership and being a shepherd is giving the kids, letting them have their fun, letting them go to the edge, but making certain that they knew that you knew and that you informed them where the lines were. Let them know where the boundaries are, where the good side is and where the bad side is, and how to stop. Absolutely. I was just thinking, you know, there's a there's a shepherd and a sheep herder, um, and sheep need somebody to follow. And so I would bet that the five challenges or the five goals that were given to that young man were completed by a scoutmaster or his foster parent. So I think to be a true shepherd, you need to walk the walk and let them see how that's done. Yes. President Crockett, did you have something? Having lived many years in Minnesota, I had a lot of winter camping. And I think the impression that came to me during this moment was have the discipline to follow the impression and prompting to get out of that warm sleeping bag, put your boots back on, put your coat back on, put your, your beanie back on, and go help that young man. Uh, we got to develop and then act with discipline in our own lives to serve the young man. Absolutely. Anyone else? Sister Ellen? I thought uh, it, the video taught me a lot about what it takes to be a good shepherd, not just a shepherd. And my takeaway from this young man was that he didn't remember anything they said to him necessarily. I mean, the five things that the man told him he should do. But what he took away was they did the things they were supposed to do. It wasn't what they said to them. It's who they were and their example. Something like that. Absolutely. I think that can be said of good mentors and good shepherds. We may not necessarily remember what they said, but we remember how we felt. Absolutely. So we've talked about what does it mean to be a shepherd? What does it mean to be a shepherd to our young men? Well, let's talk about you know, what type of individuals are our shepherds? So can I please have the volunteer look up Dr. Covenant, section 84, uh, verse 106, someone with a booing voice, 
um, who could uh, find that for us and read it aloud. <coughs> Anyone found it already? Raise your hands. Brother Edward Jackies. And if any man among you be strong in spirit, let him take with him that is weak, that he may be edified in all meekness, that he may become strong also. <laughs> what stood out? What kind of men, what kind of women does the Lord expect us to call and put in place to shepherd the weak? Those strong in the spirit. So I'm going to invite you right now, take 30 seconds, write in your notebook, in your journal, what does it mean to you to be strong in the spirit? Who do you think of when you hear strong in spirit as it relates to shepherds? Go ahead, take 30 seconds, and I'll have you share. Someone others want to hear, uh, somebody who's bold, perhaps somebody who has the answers. I talked about being adaptable, but they're not offended by what they hear. They're, they're still willing to listen and to work with somebody, even though they can be offended. Thank you. I feel a lot of the things that came up often was using visual examples, looking back at the scriptures, and the two individuals that oftentimes came up were Captain Moroni, healing it. Strong, very you know, physical, but also strong in spirit. Righteous men who are led by the spirit. I would challenge you that one of the things that comes to mind for me, someone who's strong in spirit, is someone who magnifies their calling. And someone who magnifies their calling as it relates to the young men's program and the scouting program is someone who seeks out and does the training. Someone who is trained. Every boy deserves a leader who's trained. Can I have a volunteer read the next quote for us? Someone up front? Gentleman to my left? Thank you for volunteering. I know companies that don't even allow a new employee to step into the plant or office until he has received initial training. They do that because they know that without training, most individuals will be ineffective in the job they were hired to do. And yet, we call leaders to strengthen, motivate, and prepare young men for missionary service and life in general without one iota of training. Thank you. I think it's safe to say that we probably would not step into a raft and go down a river with class four or five rapids with someone who's never gone down that river before, let alone know how to guide that, 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 that raft. Why would we call leaders to shepherd our young men, young men and young women who do not understand the importance of being trained and taking upon that training? It's important. It's critical. It's necessary. It's what's expected. Now, we've talked about what it means to be a shepherd, what, it, what a shepherd looks like. Let's talk about, and we'll do this through an activity now, what shepherds do, how they guide. And so... 
To do this activity, I need some volunteers. Um, what we're going to do is, by show of hands, who's over six foot two? Okay, I need my four or six, four, six foot two. Please come forward. And if it's six and a half, three quarters, that counts. <laughs> And now I need, let's see, how many do I have? I have five. I need, so who's between six and six two? Okay, so I need my first, actually, I need, I need your help still. So you three, I'd like you to come forward, please. All right. <coughs> So what I want you to do real quick for the next minute is to look at the three scenarios we have up on stage. And I want you as you look at these three scenarios, I would like you to reflect on the following three questions. Which arrangement do you believe is the most desirable and why? Which arrangement do you find the least desirable and why? And what impact does the shepherd have in each scenario? And brethren that, that are on the stage, you're welcome to look at the different scenarios. But make sure that you're standing shoulder to shoulder. Take the next minute or so, look through each of these examples, and ponder these questions. And then I'm going to seek your, 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 your input. So go ahead, take a gander, and think about it. What's the most desirable? What's the least desirable? And what impact does a shepherd have in each of these scenarios? Share with us what you've observed. And then this also applies to the gentleman up here will ask for your feedback as well. But please stand up and share with us your thoughts. First, like I just, um, first, I just explained to my wife, um, let me just make sure everybody understands what's going on up there, too. The first example to our far left, we have the form advisors, which would be our adults, leading the group. And the form president is just basically going along with them. In the second one, we have the form president and the advisors at the same level, so they're all kind of sharing ideas. And the third, we have the form president taking the lead with the adult advisors behind them. <coughs> Ideally, for me, the most desirable one would be the one on the right, with the form president being the lead and the advisors supporting his decision. And the least desirable probably would be the advisors on the very uh, left um, taking the lead, the, the president going along with them. Thank you. What else? What other observations? President Jameson? Well, in our experience, I think there's um, times and places where each three of those would be effective. 
Um, I know ideally we don't like far left, but I can say if we did not intervene with our eye adventure this past summer, we would be going to the Children's Museum in Jump Zone. So, <laughs> in cases like that, we had to hijack the activity and turn it into what we knew, what the bishop knew, would be an effective activity for the young men. Ideally, it's a far right, but like I said, I think there's situations where all things would be effective. Thank you. Is there a brother in the front? I, I, I think what you see here is a progression. Okay, I have to agree with exactly what, what the other gentleman was saying, but I, I find that at times I, I cringe when I hear people say, well, this is a boy that program. Okay, in the high adventure activity example, if those boys have never planned something like that, somebody has to show up. Somebody has to put that lead in. And so you may start on the far left, and as time progresses and with consistency, you may find yourself on the right. And that, to me, is where and we struggle at times in, in the church because of, of, of scouting is, is so integrated with, with, uh, with, our, with our priesthood activities and such that it's oftentimes we miss the fact that, you know, we start here as advisors and because leadership changes and adults move and et cetera, the consistency of our programs needs to wind up here on, on the right. And a boy led program is something that you become. You don't just walk in there the first day and say, okay guys, Tell me what you want to do. Oh, we all want to go to Disney World. Okay, well, let's just go to Disney World. I mean, it, it, you, you have to be able to provide to get to this point, that, that, that form of leadership for, for it to become a boy that program. Thank you. There is that progression. I, I guess my, my thought is, in hearing the last few comments, is, but is that intervening in that fashion really deviating from this course on the right. Does a quorum leader and shadow leadership mean that you can't save the choice? Now, wait a minute, what are our objectives and purpose? Is it really consistent with that? Would we go to Disney World or Jump Zone? So I guess I'm just throwing out the question. The two examples that we've just thrown out, are they not consistent with this example on the right? What are your thoughts? Yeah, sometimes when this discussion comes up, we, we think the example on the right means the quorum president standing on his own. We have quorum advisors, they are to advise, they are to counsel, they are to guide and direct. And, and sometimes, as I say, when we talk about that, we, we take them out of the picture and think, okay, you're on your own, you're on the program. Sometimes in, in the church, I've found, particularly among our youth, we don't properly train our youth to be. And uh, you know, I think that, that's really an issue that, that needs to be discussed and um, needs to be uh, addressed. That's a, that's, a, that's a challenge for you and an invitation to you. As, as you go back to your wards and your states, think about, as a shepherd, how can we, are we doing a good enough job preparing our young men to be leaders? Are we giving them those, those stretch opportunities? Are we setting, putting them aside before that presidency meeting or before BYC? and walking through the things that they are prepared to talk about. Are we doing enough of that? What else do we have? Yes. Okay. Uh, so one thought that came to my mind uh, as we were having this discussion, particularly about leadership, um, we're teaching these youth how to be leaders. Um, but I think we also need to keep in mind adult leaders, do they not have counselors? And do they not have people that are advising them? When we meet as a ward, do we not have ward counsel? And we have input from the Relief Society, from the young men, from the young women, leaders. So, whereas this is good, to his point, I think that it's okay as leaders if, if the youth are making decisions about going to the zone or uh, whatever they want to do, if they want to go putt -putt golfing every week or play basketball, that it's okay and appropriate, and we are teaching them how to be leaders if we advise them and we give them opportunities. Now we cannot bully them, and we cannot you know, force our will because that's not the way that God does it, but it's completely appropriate to suggest and to give ideas because that's how the church works and that's how the councils work. And that's why we have councils even as leaders and adults. 
I've never, I've never considered this from a youth perspective on shepherding, where this is the leaders leading, this would be the youth leading and teaching us adults how to because we're not trained, we don't know our responsibilities, so the youth has to lead because we don't know what the heck we're doing. Where this is us showing them how. So if we reverse it, this would be us failing to do our duty, and this would be us doing our duty from a youth perspective. Yes. Brother, uh, here, I yeah, I think there's one significant thing that is with all three groups there is each one of them are close together. So many of our programs are very much separate and we don't know who the right people are. We are still waiting to call someone within the quorum and they're separate. So depending on the situation, each one of these circumstances works, works really well. But if you're not close together, you know, how can you accomplish anything? I think that's a great point. Great point. Like me, I, I don't uh, I don't like to be bossed around. Just kind of point me in the right direction and let me go. And, and I think if you take, uh, and you can actually do this visually, graphically, uh, if you take the purposes of the Ryan Priesthood or the, the uh, objectives of various scouting programs, for instance, varsity, you've got high adventure, you've got rank advancement, you've got service, etc. There's five five components or five principles. And you, and you start to build the boundaries of your of your playground and then show that to the young man to say, anything within this box, corn president or senior patrol leader, knock yourself out, have a blast, but stay within the boundaries. And, and the corners of those boundaries are the purposes of your program. And I have found that that's a really good way to engage in corn presidency or a, a scout leadership council to say, here's what we can do anything spare game as long as we stay within the boundaries and objectives of our program. I can't think of a better definition of a shepherd a shepherd outlining, you know, this is where you operate. This is where we can go. Yes, over here. I have uh, kind of had a thought come to my mind. The prophet said to one person, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. And a lot of that's what we're doing. We have to teach the correct principles, and then we have to let them learn how to use those principles and, and govern themselves. Uh, I think that's something we need to keep in mind. Well said. Uh, brother and then Sister Mike? Well, just thinking again of the comment that was made here, I, I remember a call in I had that I greatly appreciated the president saying to me, okay, these are your roles. I'm not going to worry about those. Those are yours. I'd like them to you. But know that I am always a resource. I'll do anything you need me to do to help you take that on. It's your responsibility, but I'm your resource. And I appreciate that. And that's a powerful message we can deliver to our young men to say that. And that goes back to instilling confidence, saying, I'm here to support you. You can do a lot of, a lot of hard things. Sister Mike? Yeah, so my thought actually just echoes that. I, whenever I think of shepherding or being a leader of youth, I always go to the course of I am a child of God, which says, lead me, guide me, walk beside me. And so I think of, you know, you as a leader, as a shepherd, you do, you guide them, you give them those parameters, and but then you don't just hang them out there to dry. You are there to walk beside them if they need any support or help, as then they take what you taught them. Thank you. All right, well, brother, thank you for your, for your help. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and take your seats. We've talked about what a shepherd is. We've talked about who our shepherd should be. We've talked about how they should guide. One of the things that, if time permitted, we were going to do is a fun activity that we did a film on that, believe it or not, does in fact work, and it's the idea of planning a high adventure within five minutes. We don't have five minutes, but if we did, we would be able to plan a high adventure. And the point of this activity was to demonstrate that oftentimes we fall into this trap of, well, geez, young men, they're just not prepared, they don't have enough experience. They can't put on the high adventure. So we're going to plan it all for them. We need to be there as that safety parameter, that reality check. But they 
do have the ability, they do have the capacity to plan and lead their activities. It's a boy-led program. They have the capacity. We just have to be able to give them the opportunity and to shepherd them properly. And this was a great example. We would have split you into groups and given you different assignments, and we would have had an activity planned at a high level within five minutes. But once again, this demonstrates that as shepherds, we're not in charge. This is a boy-led program. We don't hold the keys. The boys do, and the mission does. Remember that. In closing, I want to leave with you a short video. And, and, and remember this, that as the, at the end of the day, when it comes to shepherds, we have a purpose. And our purpose as it relates to the young men in this church are to help them learn their duty to God and to do it. That is the purpose. And so as we plan our activities, as we sit down with them in council, we always need to remember what is the purpose. There comes a time in the life of every young man for serious contemplation and wise evaluation concerning his future. For decisions determine destiny. The scout, in his promise, undertakes to do his duty to his king and country only in the second place. His first duty is to God. There is a high ambition before us, namely the promotion of the kingdom of God. That is the rule of peace and goodwill on earth. Duty to God means a lot more than saying a prayer every time you need a favor. A lot more. Duty to God is simply the voluntary gesture you must make and remake a million times in your lifetime as a statement of your recognition that there's someone above this universe who watches over this universe. By enter whom each of us is a favorite son. Believe in anything you want to believe in, but keep God at the top of it. With Him, life can be a beautiful experience. Without it, without it, you're just fighting time. I am pleased to stand firm for an organization that teaches duty to God and country. That <coughs> is the Scout Law. Yes, an organization whose motto is Be Prepared, and whose slogan is Do a Good Turn Daily. We scouts count ourselves a brotherhood despite the difference among us of country, creed, or class. There is no religious society of the movement. The whole of it is based on religion. That is on the realization and service of God. Respecting wards and stakes, 
And at the end of this session, you'll have an opportunity to meet us with boards and states and discuss the things that you have learned and shared. And I would challenge you to think about the following <coughs> questions. When you go back, how will you go about strengthening the shepherds in your state? How well are your activities at helping the youth? And how well are your activities at contributing to real growth? <coughs> So think about those questions, and as you leave, go home, think about how you can, how do you answer those questions. I want to leave you with my testimony that I know this program, the scouting program, is an inspired program. And I stand with President Monson and my support of it. I know that scouting helps make boys into men. I am grateful for the influence that it's had on my life, the life of my family, and the life of those young men that we've all had the opportunity to serve. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.